The Russian Revolution by Rosa Luxemburg, Chapter 2, The Bolshevik Land Policy. The Bolsheviks are the historic heirs of the English Levelers and the French Jacobins. But the concrete task which faced them after the seizure of power was incomparably more difficult than that of their historical predecessors. Importance of the agrarian question, even in 1905, then, in the Third Duma, the right-wing peasants, the peasants question and defense, the army. Surely the solution of the problem by the direct immediate seizure and distribution of the land by the peasants was the shortest, simplest, most clean-cut formula to achieve two diverse things, to break down large land ownership and immediately to bind the peasants to the revolutionary government. As a political measure to fortify the proletarian socialist government, it was an excellent tactical move. Unfortunately, however, it had two sides to it, and the reverse side consisted in the fact that the direct seizure of the land by the peasants has in general nothing at all in common with socialist economy. A socialist transformation of economic relationships presupposes two things so far as agrarian relationships are concerned. In the first place, only the nationalization of the large landed estates as the technically most advanced and most concentrated means and methods of agrarian production can serve as the point of departure for the socialist mode of production on the land. Of course, it is not necessary to take away from the small peasant his parcel of land, and we can with confidence leave him to be won over voluntarily by the superior advantages first of union and cooperation, and then finally of inclusion in the general socialized economy as a whole. Still, every socialist economic reform on the land must obviously begin with large and medium land ownership. <clears throat> Here, the property right must first of all be turned over to the nation or to the state, which with a socialist government amounts to the same thing. For it is this alone which affords the possibility of organizing agricultural production in accord with the requirements of interrelated large-scale socialist production. Moreover, in the second place, it is one of the prerequisites of this transformation that the separation between rural economy and industry, which is so characteristic of bourgeois society, should be ended in such a way as to bring about a mutual interpenetration and fusion of both to clear the way for the planning of both agrarian and industrial production according to a unified point of view. Whatever individual form the practical economic arrangements may take, whether through urban com communes, as some propose, or directed from a governmental center, in any event, it must be preceded by a reform introduced from the center, and that in turn must be preceded by the nationalization of the land. The nationalization of the large and middle-sized estates and the union of industry and agriculture. These are two fundamental requirements of any socialist e economic reform, without which there is no socialism. That the Soviet government in Russia has not carried through these mighty reforms, who can reproach them for that? It would be a sorry jest indeed to demand or expect of Lenin and his comrades that, in the brief period of their rule, in the center of the gripping whirlpool of domestic and foreign struggles, ringed about by countless foes and opponents, to expect that under such circumstances they should already have solved or even tackled one of the most difficult tasks, indeed, we can safely say, the most difficult task of the socialist transformation of society. Even in the West, under the most favorable conditions, once we have come to power, we too will break many a tooth on this hard nut before we are out of the worst of the thousands of complicated difficulties of this gigantic task. A socialist government which has come to power must in any event do one thing. It must take measures which lead in the direction of that fundamental prerequisite for a later socialist reform of agriculture. It must at least avoid everything which may bar the way to those measures. Now the slogan launched by the Bolsheviks, immediate seizure and distribution of the land by the peasants, necessarily tended in the opposite direction. Not only is it not a socialist measure, it even cuts off the way to such measures. 
It piles up insurmountable obstacles to the socialist transformation of agrarian agriculture. The seizure of the landed estates by the peasants, according to the short and precise slogan of Lenin and his friends, go and take the land for yourselves, simply led to the sudden chaotic conversion of large land ownership into peasant land ownership. What was created is not social property, but a new form of private property, namely the breaking up of large estates into medium and small estates or relatively advanced large unit units of production into primitive small un units which operate with technical means from the time of the pharaohs. Nor is that all. Through these measures and the chaotic and purely arbitrary manner of their execution, differentiation in landed property, far from being eliminated, was even further sharpened. Although the Bolsheviks called upon the peasantry to form peasant committees so that the seizure of the nobles' estate might estates might, in some fashion, be made into a collective act, yet it is clear that this general advice could not change anything in the real practice and real relations of power on the land. With or without committees, it was the rich peasants and usurers who made up the village bourgeoisie possessing the actual power in the hands in every Russian village that surely became the chief beneficiaries of the agrarian revolution. Without being there to see, anyone can figure out for himself that in the course of the distribution of the land, social and economic inequality among the peasants was not eliminated, but rather increased, and that class antagonisms were further sharpened. The shift of power, however, took place to the disadvantage of the interests of the proletariat and of socialism. Formerly, there was only a small caste of noble and capitalist landed proprietors and a small minority of rich village bourgeoisie to oppose a socialist reform on the land. And their expropriation by a revolutionary mass movement of the people is mere child's play. But now, after the seizure, as an opponent of any attempt at socialization of agrarian production, there is an enormous, newly developed and powerful mass of owning peasants who will defend their newly won property with tooth and nail against every attack. The question of the future socialization of agrarian economy, that is, any socialization of production in general in Russia, has now become a question of opposition and of struggle between the urban proletariat and the mass of the peasantry. How sharp this antagonism has already become is shown by the peasant boycott of the cities, in which they withhold the means of existence to carry on speculation in them, in quite the same way as the Prussian Junker does. The French small peasant become the boldest defender of the great French Revolution, which had given him land confiscated from the émigré. As a Napoleonic soldier, he carried the banner of France to victory, crossed all Europe and smashed feudalism to pieces in one land after another. Lenin and his friends might have expected a similar result from their agrarian slogan. However, now that the Russian peasant has seized the land with his own fist, he does not even dream of defending Russia and the revolution to which he owes the land. He has dug obstinately into his new possessions and abandoned the revolution to its enemies, the state to decay, the urban population to famine. Lenin's speech on the necessity of centralization of industry, nationalization of banks, of trade and of industry, why not of the land? Here, on the contrary, decentralization and private property. Lenin's own agrarian program before the revolution was different. The slogan taken over from the much condemned socialist revolutionaries, or rather from the spontaneous peasant movement. In order to introduce socialist principles into agrarian relations, the Soviet government now seeks to create agrarian communes out of proletarians, mostly city, mostly city unemployed. But it is easy to see in advance that the results of these efforts must remain so insignificant as to disappear when measured against the whole scope of agrarian relations. After the most appropriate starting points for socialist economy, the large estates have been broken up into small units. 
Now they are trying to build up communist model production units out of petty beginnings. Under the circumstances, these communes can claim to be considered only as experiments and not as general social reform. Grain monopoly with bounties. Now, post-festum, they want to introduce the class war into the village. The Leninist agrarian reform has created a new and powerful layer of popular enemies of socialism on the countryside. Enemies whose resistance will be much more dangerous and stubborn than that of the noble large landowners.